What if I told you that you could create a SQL database in Visual Studio, manage it like any other project, track it with source control, deploy it to multiple environments, and refactor it like C-sharp code? Well, in this video, I'm going to show you how to do all of those tasks and more. The best part is that it's free and it comes baked into Visual Studio. And no, we aren't going to be using Entity Framework, although this method is compatible with Entity Framework. Now, before we get started, if you're new to this channel, my name is Tim Corey, and it's my goal to make learning C Sharp easier. Sometimes that comes in the form of free videos like this one. Other times it comes in the form of challenges to encourage you to push yourself. Those are released every Thursday here on this channel. Still other times, if you want to see things put together all the way or into a larger project, a course might be the right solution for you. Those are located at IamTimCorey.com. Now down in the description, you'll see a set of links, including the blog post link for this video where you can get the source code. Okay, let's get started in Visual Studio. Today we're starting from scratch, so let's go to File, New Project. Now normally we live under the Visual C Sharp category. And so the things you find for C Sharp are in this list. But what we're going to do today is we're going to collapse that down and look at the other categories. And one of those categories is other languages. Drop that down and in here is SQL Server. In here is SQL Server Database Project. Okay, now if you don't have this, then probably what happened is when you installed Visual Studio, you didn't select the database tools option. So you can run the installer again and just make sure you select those tools options when you install Visual Studio. This does come built into Visual Studio, I believe since 2013 or 2012. Okay, but it's been redone a lot and this right now is Visual Studio 2017. And so there's some nice new things in here for this project. So SQL Server Database Project. Let's call this our SQL project. You can name it whatever you want. This does not dictate the name of your database. So this is just the project name in Visual Studio. Now for the solution name, I always like to call the solution something other than the project name so you don't get confused as to is it the solution or the project. So let's call this the SQL database project demo. Okay, that's the solution name. And we'll hit OK. And it's going to initialize this project type for us. And it doesn't have a whole lot in it. In fact, it has pretty much nothing in it. So it starts off blank. Now we have two options here. But let's talk through, first of all, what this really is. This project is going to represent the database that our application is going to talk to. If we have an application, you can just make this just a database project if you want. Now, for this demo, we won't have a WinForm app or a, a console app or MVC or something like that, but we could. We could just add that in and make this SQL project be our, our um, creation of the database itself. We can point to that database. But in this case, we're doing just this project. Now, the, this project is for Microsoft SQL Server. It's not going to be for MySQL or another brand of SQL, like SQLite. It's not any of those. It's only for Microsoft SQL Server. What this will represent is the method of creating a database. Now, if you already have a database, don't worry. You can still use your existing database and bring it into this project and start from here. Now, I'm going to start this project off with a blank database, but I will show you down the road in this video, I will show you how to import a project into a new or import a database into a new project. So let's open up the SQL Server Object Explorer. I'm going to go ahead and pin this. Now, SQL Server Object Explorer is a bit different than what you might be used to. You might be used to like the, um, there's another one, the data tools, I believe it's called. Oh, there it is, the Server Explorer. This is different. 
this is a SQL Server Object Explorer. So it's a little bit different, a little more fill featured. So if you have this one open, it's not gonna be as good. I would recommend opening up the SQL Server Object Explorer. So in here, we have two folders. One is our SQL Server we're connected to, and we have two local DB projects. Now local DB is, is something that comes built into Visual Studio, and it's essentially a SQL Server when you don't want to actually spin up a real SQL Server. But it is a real SQL Server, but it's just on disk. It's, there's no um, larger engine behind it. So right now we have no database in this local DB. We do have a few demo projects of mine in the other, the, the Project V13 one. So we'll use the uh, local DB one for today. Now also we have this projects folder. Inside here we have SQL project. Notice that relates to SQL project over here. And inside here we have what you'd normally see in SSMS, which is the list of tables, views, and all the rest. However, there's nothing in any of these things. Okay, so there's no store procedures, no views, no tables. So let's change that. Now, there's a couple ways you can go about this. We could right click on our project and say add and say new item. We have the whole list of SQL items we could add. So we can come down here to tables and views and select a file table or an index or just about anything. And table would probably be the most simple one to add. But instead what we're gonna do is we're going to right click on our table like we would in SQL Server Manager Studio and say add new table. And so say, okay, what's the table name? We're gonna call this table the person table. Notice it puts it over here in the person.sql file. Now, I'm not a huge fan of, of putting it here. Now let's refresh this real quick. And there you go, that's dbo.person. I'm not a big fan of putting it right in the root. So we're gonna go ahead and, and move that into a folder in just a minute. But for now, let's look at what it's done. It's created a script called person.sql. And it's created for, we have an editor here, which is, you know, clickable editor can change uh, values here. And it's allowed, it's created an ID for us. And it says the primary key and that's it. So the first thing I always do with primary keys is I make them auto increment. Well, I don't remember the SQL syntax for making that auto increment. If I did, I could type it down here in this T SQL window, because whatever I type down here will be reflected up here. However, I don't remember the syntax, so I can go over to properties. In my properties, I have identity specification is identity. So it's gonna identity increment and increment C, which just means that it's gonna start off at number one and every record that gets inserted, it's gonna add the next number in the, in the sequence. That's the basic version of it. So just doing that, notice it's changed down here to T-SQL. So it says primary key identity, and now it will auto increment that value. I can hit save. We can also add a couple of fields here. Let's add first name, make it a and varchar 50 is fine. I'll leave it as allowed null. It would, I probably wouldn't put nulls in there, but that's okay. Last name and varchar. Okay, so now notice down here at T-SQL, it has updated. If I were to change this first name to first names for whatever reason, notice up here it changes it as well. So it keeps it in sync. Now, again, I'm not a big fan of where I put it. They put it right here, the person.sql. You put it right underneath the project. So let's right click and add a new folder. We'll call this folder uh, DBO for database owner. And then under here, We'll add a folder for tables and then we'll just move this into the right location. Okay. Just keeps things a little more clean and then we can do the same thing and adding more tables. Now, if you import from an existing database, it will create this structure for you. So there is a benefit there. Um, if you go that route, but you can create it like this, not a problem. 
You can leave it on the root if you wanted to, but it's just not real clean. So let's add another table. So I'll to do it this way, right click and say add, come down here to table, and we'll call this table address. And we'll make it again, um, we'll go to properties, whoops, properties and say that's the auto increment for identity. And then we'll say that we're gonna link this to the person table by person ID. We'll allow nulls and we'll say street address, city, state, and no, I'm not limiting these. Um, if you were gonna limit these, I'd say that you know zip code should probably be uh, 10, I believe, if we're talking US addresses. Um, this wouldn't do uh, addresses outside the US very well. But um, state would probably be two for the, for the two, but we're just gonna leave it just as it is for now. I'll hit save. And now if I come over here to my project, and I refresh this list, notice that the address table is over here as well. So now we have a couple of items. We have person and address. And I say, you know what, I wanna link this as a foreign key to the person table so that I know that this is a person ID. Well, again, I don't remember the syntax for it, but not a problem. I right click on foreign keys, say add new foreign key. And we'll call this the address and then the per, uh, underscore person. Okay, hit enter. And notice, and this is, I love this. Let's um, unpin this for a minute. I get red squigglies. And this is something that, you know, we're used to with C sharp, but we're not so used to with uh, SQL. But this gives us IntelliSense that says, hey, there's a problem here, unresolved reference. That's because these columns don't exist. So the column here is person ID, references to the person table, and the field is ID. So you can't do everything in this editor, but it's really easy to create stuff down here in the T-SQL window, especially if you're used to T-SQL, but even if not, the prompts are pretty clear. So it, it makes it at least on easier mode, if not easy mode. Okay, so now we have two tables and we have a foreign key relationship. Let's go ahead and bring out again our Solution Explorer and our Object Explorer. Now remember, there's no databases in the MS Local DB. Now let's verify that again by hitting the Refresh button just to show that that's still the case. Now if I right-click on my SQL project and say Publish, we select a target. So I'm going to select the um, go to browse, go to local, and I will select the MS local DB, which is that right here. And I'll hit OK. Now, there seems to be a quirk here, and I'm not quite sure why. I think it has something to do with my particular version of Visual Studio. But let me show you what's going to happen here in just a minute. I'm going to come back and hit edit again. Come back over here. Notice how it says Windows Authentication is one of the options down here. But if I select Local, MS SQL, Local DB, that goes away. And now it's not an option in this list. It's weird. I'm not quite sure why. And if I select one of these, I can't go back and unselect it. But what I want is Windows Authentication, so which is that um, trusted connection string. So I'm gonna leave it as it is, but if you were to get into a, a bind here, you can go to advanced, and you can come up here and you look for integrated security and make sure that's set to true. And as long as it's set to true, then it's a trusted connection. Okay, and there's actually the connection string right down here. So if we, we have our, um, our WinForm app down below, we could just copy this connection string and paste it into the app.config or if it's a, an MVC project, it would be the web.config. And then we can connect to this database. 
Now that's not connecting to the project. It's a little different. It's connecting to the database that we're going to publish to. So I give it a database name. Now remember, it's not this name. You don't have to name it this. You could. But I'm going to call it demo DB. All right, just to just to be clear that this database name is not the same thing as the project name. Now I'm going to save this profile. And it wants to save it in a weird location. And I'm not sure. Well, actually, it's saving the incorrect location still. So let's go to demos and we'll go to our project. So I guess it was the right location. It didn't the first time. First time it's somewhere totally off. But just make sure it's in the right location for your project. And hit save. And I'm going to rename this. So keep it as dot publish.xml. But let's call this the um, local demo DB. That way I'm clear as to what the publish profile is for. Because you might publish to more than one database. So I've saved it and now it shows up right here, local demo DB dot publish.xml. Now I can hit publish. And it's going to create my database for me. So it's thinking about it, it's going to set it up. The first time it's a little bit slow. Um, and by slow, I mean a couple of seconds. But if we now go up to our local DB and hit refresh, there's demo DB. Inside there in the tables, you see address and person. So it's created a new database for us just by publishing this, these scripts. Now, the one thing I'm going to do, I'm going to right click and I'm going to create a folder. So I'm going to add a new folder. I'm just going to call it publish locations. And I'll put that publish profile in there. Now, if I ever want to come back and publish again, which I will often, just double click on here and hit publish. See, so it's got everything filled in for you. So that's a nice little um, time saver right there. All right, just to be clear on how this demo works, I'm going to add some records to my actual published database just to kind of show you how it work in a real database. So let's add Tim Corey and John Smith and Sue Storm. Okay, so there's three records numbered one, two, and three. These are the first three records that I've created. Now let's go over to the address table and also view the data. And we're going to say that Tim lives at 123 West Main in Podunk, um, Iowa. And no clue what that, ad, that zip code is, but we'll call it good. And let's add one more. And let's just say um, Sue lives at 15 Birch Street. Um, in Seattle, Washington, again, just a made up zip code. Okay. So there's two records there. So now we have some data in the table, um, on our, our published database. Again, we don't store data down here. So if you were trying to right click and, and add data, you can't because this is just a scripts to create the database. I think it's the schema, um, designed just to uh, create or update our database. It's not meant to hold data. It's not a database. This is the database what we've published to. All right, now let's create a view. So I'm going to right click on DBO and say, add new folder. I'll call it views. I will right click, add a view. And let's call this view. Oh, I don't know. Full person. Full people. Let's call it full person. Now I'm gonna rework this just a bit. So I'll clear it out and say select. Uh, let's go with uh, p dot star and a dot a dot star. If you're not familiar with uh, SQL syntax, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to rename the tables just in this view to be P and A to make it shorter. I'll say from DBO dot notice the IntelliSense person, we'll call that P. 
and we'll say this is going to be a, a left join, which a left join means that it's going to take all the records from the person table and where we have matches, we're going to take it from the other table, which is going to be the uh, address table. All right. So, and don't worry about the syntax too much. It's, this is a SQL. And if you, you're familiar with that, great. And if you're not, it's, it's something you can give a speed on as you need it. So on, um, yep, left join on p dot id equals a dot person id. So we're gonna link up on that foreign key relationship, which is the person id to the person id. Now immediately get this error message, and we hover over it and it says the model already has an element that has the same name, um, person full person dot id. So it's got that twice. And the reason why is because the person table, if you remember, has an ID column. And so is the address table. Well, how do we solve that? Well, first of all, I want to expand. I'm not a big fan of these stars. So if you're gonna do something small or if you're sure you want the whole table, maybe, but if you wanna be more specific or if you have a conflict like this, then you need to expand to actually spell out which columns you want. Now they could type those out manually, or we can right click, refactor, expand wildcards. Notice it's saying, do you want to expand the P dot star? And we can uncheck that and just do A dot star. Or we can uncheck the A dot star and just do P dot star. Or we can do both. And notice the preview changes down here shows us what it's going to look like. We hit apply. And now all of a sudden, let's unpin these real quick. Now all of a sudden we've got this, and it's still too long. Let's give it some space here. We can see the problem. We have two columns with ID. Now we could rename one as address ID. And we could say as person ID. All right, that's a rename of a column. The problem is we now have this conflict again. So we can say, well, here we can rename that one, or we can just say, you know what? Let's call this one, let's re remove this one. We don't need it second, a second time because this really is the same as this. So therefore we remove it. So we have our choices there, but notice how the IntelliSense and the error handling worked. It actually worked just like C Sharp. It gave us an error, it pointed out the problem at design time, not when we try and run it. So. Really great stuff. Now let's go ahead and hit save because it's a valid view now. Now just so you know, if you hit build, that's a little different than we wanna do. We can hit build and it will build. And what's gonna do is check to make sure there's no errors, but there isn't right now. So we'll wait on that. So now we have this view and there's our full person.sql view. Now let's do one more thing here. I'm gonna right click on DBO. Now I could do the programmability on that store procedures. But I'm just gonna say stored procedures right here. Because that's, that's typically what I use is tables, views, store procedures. Um, I don't need to dive into programmability because I don't use functions and rules that often. So let's just leave it right here. I'm gonna right click and say add store procedure and we'll call this uh, we'll call it SP, don't call it SP underscore. That's a, that's a SQL no-no, but call it SP uh, person filter by last name. All right. And we're gonna pass in one parameter. So we'll pass in uh, last name, we'll say an NVAR char 50, and then we'll say in here, select, I'll do a star again, from dbo.person, where last name equals at last, no, it's IntelliSense, really cool stuff here. Then right click here, refactor, expand wildcards, 
hit apply. So now we have the three columns from our person table. So I hit save. So now I have a store procedure. I have a view. I have two tables. So let's go ahead and say, you know what? It's time to publish. So we can go down to our publish locations, double click on this and just say publish. That's pretty quick. If we go ahead and refresh the demo DB, we can see that tables are still there, but now we have a view and under store procedures, we have a stored procedure as well. And just to kind of prove that this doesn't destroy things, right click on person, view data, there's our records. So it's not, it's not saying, oh, I have this person table that's created again. It's saying, I already got it, we're good. Therefore, I don't need to touch it. I don't need to wipe out the data. So that's very important. Now, I'm not gonna show this video, but I wanna point out here that this is like any other Visual Studio project in that we can save this information in source control. So where it is right now, we could put in a source control and then any changes that happen would go in there as those source control differences. The one thing it doesn't do that um, the migration tools would do, so there's, there's migration and then there's upgrade tools. So this is an upgrade type path. The migration tool is the one that has both the um, script to take you to the next version and also has a script to roll back. This doesn't have the rollback script per se. Now you can create snapshots to roll back to, and we're not gonna cover that in this video, but just know that's available, but it's not quite the same thing as the, um, the rollback script of say an entity framework. However, it is much easier to work with this when you're talking about a team because it, it's just, it's easier to, to merge these things together when we have this one directional scripts. All right, so now if we come to the person table and we're looking at this and say, you know what? I don't like the fact that it says ID. I kind of wanted to say person ID. Okay, now if I did this and I saved it, if we look at the error list, look at all the problems I caused. Because I was depending on that being called ID, not person ID, which is what you get when you're modifying a SQL database in SSMS. Only you don't get the error list, you have to go manually find all these different areas. Let's undo that. We don't wanna do that. But let's right click again on ID, say refactor, rename. We wanna call it, let's call it person ID. And preview changes is down here, checked. We hit okay. Now this preview box, let's see if we can make it a little bigger. There we go. So it says, okay, the addresses table. Well, in the addresses table is a constraint that is person ID. This is what it'll look like when we change it. Person dot person ID. In the full person uh, view, we say uh, p dot ID it will say p.personid. Also, the left join is on p.id, now it'll be p.personid, and so on. So it found all the different references to our person.id and changed it over person ID. But what it didn't do is it didn't change the address table where the address table has a column called ID. So it's smart enough to know that it's not referencing the address's ID column, just the person's ID column. So this refactor goes through your entire database and looks for the actual references, not just name matches, the actual references and says, hey, I can rename those. And if you hit apply, now if you look at our error list, no errors, and yet it's person ID. Because if we go to the address table, the foreign key, we look at that, the foreign key references person, person ID column, and so on. I mean, the view references person ID and so forth. So that right there is gold. I mean, just be able to rename something and have it cascade through your entire database safely and show you what it's doing 
is pretty important. Now I'm going to push this in just a minute. Let's make sure he's saved. Going to double click on the publish. Now I could say generate script. Now what this will do, and let's just do that. This doesn't actually run that uh, this script. So if we were to right click and say uh, view designer for this in our pushed database, it still says ID. But what this does is this script, if we look down here, once it says use the database name, all the rest of this stuff is about renaming. So it's, that's all the change we really did. But this is all the, the code that get run because since we last did an update, okay? So it's looking through it, it's renaming it, person ID to person ID, and all the rest of the SQL code. And then it says it's complete. So I could give this script to my database administrator if I wanted to. If my DBA doesn't want to use Visual Studio and have it published that way, we could have it create the SQL script and then just hand that off to whoever's doing it. Now I find it easier to just have it publish automatically. I hit publish, it's done. If we go to the person table and look at our columns, it's now person ID. The really cool thing is right click, view data. It hasn't changed anything as far as our data goes. Data is still there, the column name has just changed. So it tries to be very safe with your data and it tries not to just destroy data if it can help it. Now, if I were to delete the last name column, that would destroy data. And I do believe it prompts you for that. Now, what if you have, and let's close these out. What if you have a database administrator that's also working on the database you're publishing to? Now, in theory, that shouldn't be the same database you are publishing to, but let's just say it is. And the, the administrator says, you know what? I am going to modify this view. So we're going to um, view the code for this. And let's just, this is a SQL designer. So we can just go ahead and change this to alter. And instead of showing the person ID, let's go ahead and do it this way. And we will, oops, we gotta say create. It's, it's doing an update. We hit update. It's going to update that script, update database. Now, if we go over to our view over here, let's just double click on this. Oops, there we go. Notice that column is still there because I didn't update my project. I updated the database I'm pushing to. So what happens then? So that's a real world example because if you're working on a database, maybe somebody else comes along, opens up SSMS, and makes a change of their own. Well, there's a built-in tool to help you out. If you right-click on a SQL project, we can say Schema Compare. And what a Schema Compare does is it compares two different databases. So let's grab our target. Our target is, and it's the... Um, Let's go to browse, go to local, and then in here we'll select demo DB. We hit connect, we hit okay. Now what's gonna do is this is actually the wrong direction, but let's go compare it for a minute. So you hit compare and it says, click on this and it says, you know what? You have a column over here that's not over here. And so it's gonna change the demo DB, this database, to reflect what's in our project. But that's not what we want. We want to go the other direction. Fortunately, these little arrows right here. Switch the source and target. So the source is that external database that someone modified with SQL Server Management Studio. Hit compare again. Now I click on this and it says, well, you've got this right here. So I'm going to modify this row to take out the if you can see, there's, there's dark red and there's light red. The light red is what leaves. That's what goes out. So it's going to take out person ID as person ID, and it's going to start at first name. So now what we can do is we can actually just say update. 
Are you sure we're going to update? Yes. Now it's going to change this view. Now let's just double click on this view and notice that the, the ID column is gone. It's the first name table is all we have there. Now, before we do anything else, I'm going to save this compare. So again, it, it puts in a weird location. Maybe, maybe this is the one, the other one wasn't, but Oops, demos. And inside SQL project, I'm just gonna save it right here. I'm gonna say local DB um, compare. Okay, and now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go to my project, select the project itself and say, show all files. Let's Go down here and look for local DB compare and right click and say include in project. Then uncheck the show all files button. And now that compare is here. So now I'm going to create one more folder at the root. Just say compares and drag that into the compares folder. So now if I double click this, it brings that comparison up again. So if this is a regular occurrence where someone is modifying the database outside your control or outside this Visual Studio project, then you can do these compares, bring down their changes, bring them into your project, check them into source control, and you're all good again. Okay, now right now, if we do compare, it should be just no things to compare, they should be the same. Now you don't run this again the other direction necessarily because you don't need to have that the other way because that's what this publish does. So the process here, if you were to put this into a regular build process and source control and, and work on a team, is that in the morning when you open up your project, you do a, a git pull or whatever uh, source control you use um, to bring down the latest changes from the previous day or the, or the night before. And then you're gonna publish what you have to your local copy of the database. That's probably what you're working on as a local copy of a database. And then you can start going about your work, either modifying your SQL project or your other code and keep you know, committing your different changes. And you commit your changes, you push them up to the server so that um, everyone else can have access to your changes as well. Your coworker comes in, they pull the nightly changes, including your new changes, they update, their version of their local copy of DemoDB, and they keep working and committing their changes. And at some point you say, you know what, we wanna push this to our development server. And so whatever process you have, and I, I really recommend you have an automated process if you're gonna be in a, in a team or have any size project, is you would push that into your build pipeline. And if you don't have a build pipeline, I recommend looking at Azure DevOps. It used to be called uh, Visual Studio Team Services or VSTS. It's now called Azure Dev DevOps. But go there as a free account for small teams and you can create a build pipeline so that when you upload your source code or when you say, this is what I want to go to dev, it automatically builds it, it compiles it, it runs tests against it, it publishes your database changes to your dev database and then it pushes your changes to whatever server you have or what or whatnot. So all this now allows you to insert or add your SQL changes into your automated build process. You don't need to worry about things like change scripts and making sure you have those and, and making sure if you, you know, do you remember to update that or not? This takes care of all of that. So it makes it really quick, really easy to make those changes and to push them to your various servers because that same build process can then be used again for your staging environment and for your production environment. So this right here takes database management to a whole new level. I'd recommend even if you're just a SQL Server developer and not even a C Sharp developer, still use this tool. It's just so much better than just SQL Server Management Studio, even though we're kind of used to that tool. Now, a couple things I want to go over before we're done. Uh, first of all, if you wanted to just kind of play around in this database, for example, if you wanted to, um, you know, do some select statements, whatever, 
you can right click and say new query and it creates a query window just like you would see in SQL Server Manager Studio. So I can do things like select star from dbo.person. I love that IntelliSense, by the way. Now, F5 is not what you use. In SQL Server Manager Studio, F5 would run this. Instead, it's Control Shift E. So it's a little bit different. So Control Shift E or that play button right up here. You run this, there's your results and a message as well. So three rows affected, and there's those three rows. You can also execute your start procedures. So there's my start procedure, and let's say last name Smith, and execute that. And there's John Smith um, back from our start procedure. You even have things like execution plans. So some great stuff in here that you can work with under the SQL um, menu, which will pop up when you're in a SQL environment. You have a lot of options, including there's execution plans. So there's our execution plan for this store procedure, pretty simple. But you have a lot of options in here for working with your SQL code. So just want to let you know that it's it really is that full featured environment like you're used to with SSMS. You can do pretty much everything you could do in SSMS and even better. Now, before we're done, there's a couple things I want to show you. One was, let's say I got rid of this demo DB for whatever reason. It's not there. If I want to do a publish, let's just say, you know, it's gone. I want to create a new database, whatever. Just change the database name or the path to hit publish and notice what's gonna happen in just a minute. If I hit refresh, demo DB2. Now the one thing that we're missing, if we right click on persons and say view data, there's no data because we don't store the data in our SQL project. But don't worry, if you want to, you can bring some data with you. There's a couple things you can do. First of all, you could right click and say data comparison. So that's the source is the one I selected. Select a database. Let's go to local and select demo DB2. Hit connect. And now we can say next. And it's going to connect to those two databases and do a comparison. Let's just look at just the tables. So you don't have to have a comparison on views, obviously. And now it says, you know what? Address needs to add two and person needs to add three because they're only in the source. So if I were to hit generate script, it would create a script for us or I could hit update target. I do that. And now if I were to go into demo DB2, right click on person and say view data, now I have those three records. So that's a quick way to get a new database up and running if you want to make a copy or if you want to get your test environment back up and going. But maybe what you really want is you want to have a table that, let's say, has options. Um, for example, a day of the week table. You probably don't need a day of the week table, but if you did, you'd only have seven options. You know, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. But what if down the road, for whatever reason, we add an eighth day? What would you do? Well, there are scripts that you can schedule to run before or after a publish. So if we were to right click on the project itself and let's create a new folder because I like folders and organization post publish scripts and then right click on here and say add new item. and go to user scripts and say post post deploy. So I said post publish, it's post deploy. Um, same kind of thing. Let's call this, let's leave it post deployment. Oh, actually call it script dot um, post deploy uh, person. Okay, so it's gonna work on the person table. Your naming scheme can be whatever you'd like, but 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that I want to have at least one person in the person table. And that person is going to be the um, test user or demo user. Okay, so first name is demo, last name is user. Now I could do, you know, insert into DBO dot person, first name, last name, values, demo, user. The problem with this is, oops, I love that IntelliSense. The problem with this is that it's going to run this script every time I publish. So if I publish five times, we'll have five users called demo user. But if I were to do if not exists for the S, select star from dbo.person where first name equals demo and last name equals user. This is a rough script, but it'll work. Begin, end, and then in here, paste. Now, if you're not familiar with SQL, this might be a little challenging, but I'm just trying to illustrate is the fact that you can do this, not that you would have to do this, but if you get to the point where you say, you know what, I have to do this, then either watch this video and just kind of watch my syntax or Google how do I check to see if something exists because this script will run after we deploy all of our changes. The really cool thing is if I rename first name to given name in my table, it will rename this script as well. So again, great stuff. But let's go ahead. We don't have demo user in either um, in demo DB or demo DB2, but let's just open up the person and just show that. So that's not there. If I were to go to my uh, publish locations and just publish it to demo DB, so it's not DB2, I hit publish, right click on person, view data, there's demo user. If I were to publish this again, and just for giggles, let's do it one more time. Right click on person and say view data, demo user is only there once because of that check. So that's how you can add scripts that run after your, um, your publish works. You can also add scripts beforehand if you want to prep things before you make the changes. It's really up to you. Now, at the beginning of this video, I said that I'm going to show you how to create a new project, but also how to create a project if you already have an existing database. So let's pretend that demo two is an existing database. And we don't have the SQL project. So let's right click on the solution. We'll create a new project. So new project, SQL server database project. Um, let's call this SQL from existing. And now we're going to do is pretend like this database already exists. We want to move from here forward. So, oh, and just notice, I do have two different projects in the same solution that are both database projects. Perfectly fine. There may be a case where you have two different databases you need to maintain. May a log database and your primary database. That's just fine. Notice down here the from existing, and there's nothing in here because it's a blank database. But if I right click and say import, from database, select our connection, and we're going to say local and select uh, demo db2, hit connect. Notice we have some options down here we can select, but I'm going to leave it alone and hit start. Wait for it's complete. It's now complete. We hit finish. Notice it says dbo. That's kind of the order I like. And there we go. SP person filter by last name, the address and person table, and the full person view as well. Now the existing over here, same thing, it's going to match that. So we just set up from existing database. We can start from here. We can, we can commit this as it is, and then we can start making changes and 
start publishing our changes over to DemoDB2 or a different database. So it doesn't matter if you already have a database or if you're, you're just starting out. Either way, you can use this tool to put your database in a source control and have those migration scripts and have snapshots in time. You can have your team working on it together. You can keep multiple databases in sync. Um, it makes it really easy to have that development database and the staging database and the production database. So you can move your, your application from development all the way through to production together with your database instead of having two separate things you're doing. Now there's a lot still to cover. I'd love to show you how to put this in a source control. I'd love to show you how to work with a team with this. And I'm going to, just not in this video. I wanted to leave this at the introductory level for this first video. And then in future videos, we can explore and dive deep into one area or another. Okay. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down in the comments below and I'll try and get back to you. And as always, I am Tim Corey.